we are so, I think, adverse to uncertainty and this idea of like trial and error just doesn't work for a lot of people, A, because, you know, you need to work to make money and um, trial and error isn't the best in terms of stability. But I think it is an incredibly helpful thing in getting clear on your skill sets. I am delighted to bring this conversation with yet another one of our mentors, Wells Frey Smith, the assistant curator of special projects at the Whitechapel Gallery. She's responsible for the Max Mara Art Prize for Women at the Whitechapel. And prior to that, she has also worked at the Met, Barbican, and the Pace Gallery. We will be discussing all things career development as usual, with a special focus on representation in the arts, a topic very close to both our hearts. We will be talking about women in the gallery walls and behind the gallery walls, and so much more. If you like this conversation and all the other LA Networking conversations, please leave a review, subscribe, and send it to a friend. It really does help us a lot. We have a bunch of programs to support women and non-binary people in their career development in the creative industries. So head over to ilightnetworking.uk to know more. With that said, here's Wells. Wells, welcome to the Ilight Networking podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today and also have you as part of our, our mentors for this year's edition. So before you get started, would you kindly introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, where you're at currently, and what is it that you do for for a living? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Isabel, before I kind of launch into my whole backstory. It's a real honor to be on here, and I'm so excited for the mentorship scheme to start and um, what an amazing initiative. So big thank you to you. Um, so my name is Wells Frey-Smith. And I am an assistant curator of special projects at Whitechapel Gallery in London. You might be able to hear I have a slight American accent to my voice because I am originally from San Francisco, but I moved to London about 20 years ago. So I'm a hybrid British American. Um, and I have been working in the art world now for almost five years. Uh, in a mix of the commercial kind of private sector and now also working in the public sector at Whitechapel Gallery, which is a museum that was founded in 1901. And we don't have a public collection. So everything that we do is really centered around temporary exhibitions and displays, commissions, prizes, um, sometimes public art projects, and my role very much involves getting involved in the whole range of diverse ways to engage audiences in contemporary art. I love that. That's such a good explanation. Um, cool. So I think we should ask you, I didn't know you were from the States. Yeah. So what made you want to move to London? A hundred percent my parents. I had no choice. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's interesting, actually, because my mum is yeah from the West Coast of the US. And when she was a teenager, she was sent on an exchange program and she came to London for a year and lived with a British family and went through the UK kind of education system. And I think at that point, she vowed that were she ever to have kids, you know, she wanted them to be raised in London. Um, so I'm 28 now. And when I was six turning seven, we just packed our bags and kind of came here on a whim thinking it was going to be a bit of an experiment. And yeah, 21 years later, we are still here <laughs> and are just very ensconced um, in, in London and the British life. Okay, that's amazing. Do you ever go back to the States? I do go back to the States because my dad actually still lives there in San Francisco. But I also used to go back a lot more frequently than I do now because of the internationalism of the art world, really. So when I was working for a commercial gallery called Pace, uh, they had their big headquarters in New York. So I, 
I went to New York quite frequently actually and worked on exhibitions there, which was so cool and amazing and such a great work and professional opportunity to have at a young age. Amazing. So I think that's a good place for us to get started and ask you, did you always want to work with art? Were you always interested in it? And how did you get sort of like your foot on the door? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And I think there are so many layers to the answer for that. Um, I was quite clear as a teenager that I wanted to work in the arts in some way. I really loved painting and making work myself, but I didn't feel like I had the talent or the potential to be an artist. At, so at that point, I started studying art history and ended up um, doing a bachelor's in art history and then a master's in curating. And as I was studying and was looking at careers, um, I actually really felt that I wanted to be a producer of some form and maybe that wouldn't be in the art world, but I did a lot of extracurricular activities that involved putting on quite large scale cultural events, basically. So for example, I ran a um, TEDx conference at my university in London and it was always I was kind of always motivated about sharing ideas and sharing stories about what other people had created so then as I was looking for jobs and getting a bit clearer um, on what I wanted to do the transition from like producing events and telling stories while also studying art to then doing that in the art world and in that field felt quite natural. But I would say getting my foot in the door was really hard. You know, it was something that had to be done through a lot of trial and error and a lot of just being um, quite enterprising. So I did a lot of work experiences that I got basically just by writing to galleries and writing to people and saying like, hey, I'm, I'm a student and I have three days a week. Do you need an extra hand? Um, and that, that helped me focus, I guess, on what part of the art world I wanted to be a part of. But it also early on helped build a network that now that I've been working for five years, I'm starting to realize is actually a network you know it's people that I encounter in my professional life now who I'm I'm grateful to have cultivated a relationship with um, over a long period of time that's great thanks so much for your honesty Wells yeah I think there's still this massive thing in the industry at large and when I say that I mean the creative industry yeah there is this sort of almost an expectation that people will work for free a lot before getting anything getting a proper guess paying job right absolutely which is so different so different for instance for my sister who always worked in, in sort of like finance she went to business school mm. and on her first internship she you know had benefits and mm. you know a, a really good salary and all that so obviously she worked mad hours but so do you right? yeah so yeah um it's it is definitely a pervasive sort of thing I and guess. it's it it feels to me so problematic um, <laughs> because it yeah it perpetuates a system basically where you know essentially the art world is exists primarily on stilts of unpaid labor where people also feel grateful to have opportunities to work which I hate because I think you know, in a very cynical way, a job is a bit of a, um, it's a transaction of like your time and your skills in exchange for money. And I think we can feel privileged to have jobs and we can love our jobs and we can feel pleasure. But um, this idea of gratitude is also really problematic because it opens the door for people essentially to be like, essentially to be abused you know like yeah to be overworked underpaid taken for granted 
lose their sense yeah, of it's, self. It's terrible. A hundred percent. It's almost like it's we are punished by really being passionate about something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I agree and I always am very up up front when people ask me as well about my experience. They're like, Oh, you've created a company so early. I was like, yeah, well, I was living with my mom. I didn't have to mm. pay any bills. You know, mm. I could afford to not have to a salary that. for six months. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I didn't have student debt. So obviously, it's already a big jump. It's not an opportunity available for any single person at any point in their yeah. lives. Right. But I wanted to kind of circle back to something you said about doing big productions and events. I think that's fascinating. A lot of the people we talk to uh, in the networking community, be that the membership, the mentoring, or our events. Uh, always talk about doing different things at times and not knowing exactly how to phrase their narrative mm-hmm. and so on. So how do you think that helped you to do what you do now in your life, if it helped you I, It all? definitely helped me. And I would say, I would say my role as a curator, um, is incredibly multifaceted. So I think people have this idea of a curator sometimes as an intellectual, someone who does a lot of research, thinks about telling stories, you know, they put art on a wall, on the walls and create an experience for an audience. But the reality of what that involves is extremely logistical. It's a lot of talking to people, getting their buy-in, um, figuring out how you're going to go from A to B within a really confined budget. Uh, Yeah. Dealing with like shipping and fabrication and construction and paint colors and um, communications. And, you know, it's, it's the skill set. I think is incredibly wide. And my experience with doing these kind of productions and festivals was that it made me think in both terms. So firstly, about what I wanted to program and what I wanted an audience to take away and what I wanted a live experience to be like, you know, how I wanted people to feel, what emotions I wanted to elicit. But it also really made me think in practical terms of like, okay, there are going to be 200 people coming through the door wow, they're going to need chairs and like, they're going to need a program. And what does that journey kind of look like? And I feel lucky that I had those early production experiences while I was at university that essentially meant I could learn by doing, you know, those were the opportunities that I just got to try things out. I would say my process wasn't necessarily like professional or perfect, but you just do it, you give it a go, you learn. And the more and more you do it, the better you get. Uh, and that that gave me confidence when I was applying for jobs and in my role now, because I, I can look back on that experience and say, oh yeah, okay, I've done quite a few things that are really helpful in, in what I need to now produce for Whitechapel. That's amazing. Uh, I love that. And it's such a good tip for anyone who does have sort of like a multifaceted background and wants to get into something else. And I, someone asked this question actually on Monday on this event we had on, oh, my, my past life doesn't necessarily apply to what I want to do mm. in the future. And I said, we're not that interested about your past life as long as you can tell us your lessons and what you've learned from it and you know, how does that inform where you want to go? That's fine. Yeah, right? absolutely. But I appreciate appreciate that that's not always that easy to do with job applications. Yeah. It's different when it comes to mentoring. But uh, you touched upon your work at the White Chapel. And if I'm not mistaken, you work very closely with the Max Mara Art Prize for Women. I do. Is that still the case? I do, which um, is, is actually such... A privilege. It's an amazing, amazing initiative. Can we talk a little bit about that? About what what does that actually entail on a year yearly basis? But also, I love your sort of vision on what it is still like for representation. You know, of 
women mm-hmm. artists in the in the world. I know it's a huge topic and you've done massive talks about this before, but we should delve into this. A Absolutely. Bit, considering we are a women focused program. Absolutely. Um so to start, maybe I can tell you a little bit about the Maxmar Art Prize for Women and then I'll go into your point about representation and what it tries to fix and correct and how it aims really to be an industry leader in helping women artists in a way that is genuinely useful for them to advance their careers. Um, So it's an initiative that started 15 years ago as a collaboration between Whitechapel Gallery, the fashion house, Max Mara, and uh, the private collection of the owner of Max Mara called Collezione Maramotti, which are in Reggio Emilia in northern Italy. Um, and what it, it happens every two years, the prize, and it affords the winning artist, which is always an artist who identifies as female uh, and is based in the UK, although they don't have to be British, but they have to be based in the UK and hasn't had a solo exhibition at a major institution in the UK before. And it affords this artist essentially the gift of time and space and money to be able to make new work. Um, So what that means is that she is given a bespoke six month residency in Italy that's organized by our partners Collezione Maramotti And this might take her around the country. Um, One artist, Helen Kamek, who's a previous winner and then went on to win the Turner Prize. She went to six cities in six months and was researching examples of female resistance and also songs and the voice. Um, So artists can choose essentially what they want to do. And it's very artist led. And off the back of that six month residency, the winning artist gets a solo show at Whitechapel Gallery for which they have a production budget essentially to make brand new work based on their research and their findings in the residency. And then that show travels to Collezione Maramotti and it has a, um, again, bespoke publication. And at the end of that exhibition cycle, the work then gets collected by Collezione Maramotti in it and it enters their collection. And the the statistics around the representation of women in the arts currently are staggering. You know, only 11% of works in US museums, for instance, are by female artists. Um, I think it was only nine of 35 winners of the Turner Prize have been women. So we are at a point where there isn't equity in how much women's art is seen um, and also how much it kind of sells for on a market, you know, like in auction houses to um, prices by male artists far surpass the prices by female artists. So what the prize tries to do is essentially intervene in this very vicious cycle that mean that women are consistently oppressed by a system where their work doesn't sell for very much money. They therefore don't have enough money to continue to produce work, especially if they're mothers. Um, They're not supported to be able to fund their research as they're not making work, they're also not getting a huge amount of visibility and have gallery representation, which means it's harder for them to get institutional shows and have their book be in catalogs. Um, And so what, and then that cycle repeats itself of kind of no visibility, no money, no shows. And what the prize does is it, it gives that artist all of those things. So it is really important work it feels like something that um I wish more people knew about and I wish more institutions would do similar things um 
and it's sad for me that it is still a kind of necessary corrective but it it feels like it is this is great thank you so much i think it for anyone who doesn't exactly know how the art world operates that's really good sort of like starter starting point yeah. for where the issues are when it comes to representation and i agree that the prize does such an important job in taking care of all those sort of areas mm. and Obviously, it's great that it's run by a woman. Yes. Because it would be complicated otherwise. So how involved are you in the sort of selection? How is the selection process? Because I would imagine there's some sort of committee. Do you have guest judges? Exactly. Yes, that's a brilliant question. So what we do for each cycle of the prize is we invite four gatekeepers, essentially, of the art world. And that is... An art, firstly, a, an artist. We invite also a collector. We invite a gallerist, and then we invite a critic or a curator. And the idea is is that these four things—an artist, a collector, a gallerist, and a curator—they're all seeing new work, but they're probably seeing it in different contexts and also have different priorities, I guess, when they look at work. So we want their different perspectives and their different voices, and they each come to Whitechapel Gallery and over two days we essentially um, sit and talk and dissect work and they each bring five artists to the table and present them and we talk about it and then from that long list of 20 artists that gets narrowed down to a short list of five And those five artists are then announced as the shortlist. And we invite those artists to present a proposal for how they might want to spend six months in Italy and where their research might take them. Um, And then again, over a day, we hear from the artists, we see images and anything that they're proposing. um, And then we have fierce debate and then one winner is selected and I actually don't have a vote on that committee I um, am there very much to kind of orchestrate and organize and listen and try to bring together everyone's voices to help that you know feedback on on what they've said to help them make a decision Um, but it's it's those four people who ultimately decide It must be difficult to stay, you know, because I'm sure you have opinions as well. And you have, you might, you must have at some point, some favorites and you're like, yeah, wish that person got it. I don't know. I think selecting people or shortlisting anything, it's super hard. It's, it is so hard. And actually I've, I have been involved in it in another project I've been working on, which is an open call exhibition that we do at Whitechapel Gallery that has been running since 1932. So it's a big part of our exhibition history um it's called the london open and this year we got 2600 applications and i oh my god had the privilege i guess of looking at all of that work alongside you know many many colleagues and another jury um and it's again it's a huge responsibility and i think the main thing is just being transparent with everyone about your process and what you're looking at and what you're looking for that's exactly what I was going to ask you right now so you read my mind so how does it work like what are some of I guess the yeah the the steps you go through to assess something because you you're gonna have a system in place right you definitely can't just be all I mean I I sure there's part of it that's like a gut instinct but that is a difficult thing to measure yeah well with art too, I think the thing that's fascinating as you as you judge it is that you're judging it against so many different criteria. So in my mind, you're looking at the material and the material expression. You're looking at the concept um, and like how rigorous that concept might be. You're looking then at how the concept is expressed through the material <laughs> and its construction. Um you're looking at the stories, you're looking at the form, you know, and all of these things come together quite literally sometimes to like paint a picture of what an artist is is trying to do. 
Um, for the London Open, we were really clear, I think, with our applicants that we wanted work that felt like it was pressing and responsive to the current moment in which we're in. Um, and that meant politically, but it also meant artistically that we were thinking about what artists were doing and making that and how that might be informed by things like Brexit, by COVID, rising house prices in London. You know, the subject maybe didn't matter. It was about them telling us what it what it was. Um, but it's 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 hard. It's a lot of looking really carefully, reading what the artists have said about their work, spending a lot of time with it, and then conferring with other people. And that feels like a really important part of the process too, that no decision is made in isolation. You know, multiple people have eyes on the work, multiple people are seeing it and are bringing their thoughts and responses. And those then come together um, to form an outcome. I think that's a great thing so much for explaining Wells. And also that, I guess, leads very well to one of the things that we are trying to do as I like and Ricky and so are you now that you yeah. join us in that there are so many gatekeepers when it comes to the art, art world. I mean, there are gatekeepers anywhere, obviously, but the art world specifically has a lot of those mm. processes to decide who goes in, who's not, who's good now, who is not. And if we don't really have sort of like a diverse workforce that the, the end result might still look like a lot of, you know, people that look like cis say, white male. Or, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I Absolutely. think it's really important that those things are clear and discussed and people understand. And obviously then, uh, you, you know, like if someone is talking about something topical, it might be something topical to women or to trans uh to trans population as opposed to just the like white male experience mm. right mm. but i think it's a change that we're still seeing I, like in, in the world definitely and i think there's a lot of work that the art world still needs to do and a lot of kind of admitting i think also on the part of curators that we don't just select work because it's excellent and what I mean by that is that there, there was a, I think for a long time, museums, institutions, individuals would say like, yeah, we're doing a show of this artist because it is, it is excellent work and it is the best kind of work. And that was a lazy way in many senses just to say that we're colorblind, right? And we like don't make decisions yeah. on the basis of race or sexuality or sex. Um, and that to me feels like a very coded way of basically trying to deny that we have any bias. And I think what is really important now is for curators to say like, yeah, we're looking at work because it's excellent, but we're also looking at work because we realize that we have been implicit in a system that has consistently rewarded cis white men. And so we are being incredibly conscious about our biases and trying to correct that and revise history and tell overlooked stories. And, and I think we need to be more vocal about the fact that that we are doing that um that feels like a really important yeah. step friends this is a quick break to tell you about our amazing sponsors day and a women-led company revolutionizing your periods with sustainable tampons you can be proud of which are clinically validated cramp seating cbd tampons delivered straight to your door whenever it fits your cycle to get five pounds off your first box of tampons or probiotics just head over to yourday.com and use the code NETWORKING5. I'd like to know, since we're talking about the practice of curating as well, yeah. what is one thing that you spend a lot of time doing, you know, as an assistant curator, that you wouldn't, that you didn't expect you would be? That I would do. Yeah. Um, wow, this is going to sound so boring, but I think I... It's emails, in all honesty, <laughs> which feels very like 
very real at the moment, given that I'm working from home. Um, I, I think I had this idea that like as a curator, you were in galleries and in warehouses and in artist studios and you know, you're hands on and you're looking at things and you're running around and you're handling these art objects and like 100% you are, but that is a kind of small percentage actually of your day to day and what you're really doing. And I think what I have found in, in putting together essentially these big cultural moments, these big exhibitions that take years to plan is that you know, the majority of what I do is talking to people and the the method through which that happens is email. And it's using email to get people's buy-in, to communicate about what you're doing, to see if they have any feedback, to figure out how to go from A to B. Um, it is, oh yeah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I love, well, that is, I think it's important. Like I, I always tell people, they ask me like, oh, what are the skills you need in the creative industry? And I always say like, well, reading contracts and doing spreadsheets are very important, whatever you do. Big time. <laughs> so Big time. Become, become good at those, which are not fun at all. But yeah. I mean, I personally like spreadsheets, but I, I am uh, originally a producer. So I guess that makes that sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But so on the flip side, what is the thing you love the most about your job? Oh, wow. I mean, I there is this magic moment that happens when you might have been working with an artist or a selection of artists for years or for months on helping to realize their vision. And there's this magic moment when it's the vision is realized, the work is made, it's in the gallery, you open the doors and suddenly people come to see it and experience it. And then you hear these testimonials of what they, what they took away. And I think for me, that is the most rewarding and just incredible moment is understanding that this artwork or this story that you have helped to usher into the world has done something for someone else. Um, so it's, it's kind of when the artist and the audience and the work and the public come together. That's, yeah, I love it. That's interesting. You could definitely be like a, I mean, I know that there is performance art and dance that the White Chapel does, yes. but you could definitely be like a live art slash theater producer because you seem to be the one who likes the the audience like feedback, which is my thing as well, which is interesting. I would have imagined it was something directly with the work, but that's cool. Yeah, I, I really care so much about the audience feedback. And I think, I think you know, I, I see myself really actually as working in service of the artist and it's about them being able to create their vision and not having to compromise on their ambitions, you know, but, but all of that feels like it's, you know, you're making it because it's bigger than just that artist and just that one thing, you know, that artwork has, I think this incredible power to move us and challenge us and engage us. And it, so it's in those moments of interaction that, um, you know, I, I feel at least incredibly like exhilarated and rewarded. That's brilliant. I'll, I'll ask you a slightly polemic question. Okay. Yeah. No names needed, obviously. Have you ever had to sort of work on an exhibition of an artist in any institution you've been in that you really don't like their work or that you don't, it, it was not something that you you know, intimately appreciated or were mm. super excited about. And if you did, how did you, what do you do? That like, is, how did you go about it? Such an interesting question because I think, <laughs> I think I have definitely thought that going into an exhibition project of like, oh, maybe this isn't, if I, if I were far more senior and were choosing the artist and the work, maybe this isn't what I would choose um 
But what has been fascinating and one thing I've learned as I've worked more and more and have dealt with art more and more is that as soon as you start engaging with it, it's actually really hard to hate it because even if it's, even let's say aesthetically, you think it's really ugly or, and it's just a painting and it's primarily brown and you're like, ugh, hate brown. That's not for me, you know, and that's your response. The more time you spend with it, the more time at least it prompts these questions in me of like, ooh, why do I hate brown? And like, ah, is there a reason that it was brown? And what does that say about either that artist or about the time in which she made the work? And, you know, that line of inquiry uh, puts me at a point where at the end result, I'm like, oh, wow, I really actually don't hate this at all (laughs) because it did something to me essentially. Um, so, so I definitely have, have worked on shows where I haven't loved the work at first glance, but then, you know, it has come to, to be quite important. I love that. Thanks for answering. And also, I think you learn a lot by things that you have a strong reaction to. Definitely. Like you it's, do. it's really great <laughs> in that way that you're like, okay, I really don't like, I've also had to work in stuff uh, for stuff that I was like, ugh, I really don't want to do this. Yeah. Like, I don't care about this specific thing. And yeah. then you find, I guess, things to to move you. And there's also, you know, value, I guess, when you're talking about the audience. Like, when you see that the audience really does like that or engage mm. with it, that you're like, well, it's not just my opinion that matters, right? Like, as you said, you are kind of you know, of service to this connection. Precisely. That you, you should... I, I am from the, like, I'm someone with very eclectic taste, as anyone who will know me will make fun of. <laughs> uh, that they'll, you know, tell me that I was reading Harry Potter one day and Dostoevsky the other, and yeah. working with jazz, instrumental jazz, but then going to, like, country music concerts. So I, I don't have this whole, like, oh, this is, like, the good mm. art, this is a bad, because I feel like as, as long as people are enjoying it and there's a public that it has to have some value to it even if it's not expert value attached to it but you know you can't just dismiss things absolutely Um, it's like dismissing that boy bands made an impact in the world you know okay maybe if you're a rock and roll fan you think that's terrible like my dad yeah but he you know he would still go and be like okay fine I guess this is important right now. (laughs) Yeah, well, precisely, precisely. And I think that is such an interest for anyone who's in a position where they are choosing and making decisions, be it curators or people who program a festival lineup or, you know, I think of like someone who's even inviting speakers to give TED Talks or something at a conference. You know, it's, it's, up to you to decide what's good but it's also up to you to try to negotiate what you think people need to hear whether you think you know it might not be something that you think is the most groundbreaking thing in the world but it might have serious value for other people um and and I think for the art world too there's a question of yeah public engagement that especially for institutions in the UK that are free but make their money through ticket sales for special exhibitions there's also it's really important to not underestimate your public and to realize that they vote with their feet and by coming to the shows Um, and so programming in such a way where you know it has meaning to them and they will come is really important for the financial health of institutions and art spaces. Yeah, hundred percent. I love this. I could talk to you all day about programming. That was my dissertation, and I have a like really? slash friend colleague who. Yeah, he used to work uh, as a one of the music programmers at the Lincoln Center. And oh my god! Wow. He said. Pro, program yeah he also worked the public uh theaters so all that stuff and he said that there's a little there's a very delicate balance as a programmer between 
giving what the public wants mm-hmm. and also giving what they want but don't know yet. Exactly. And, and I thought that was exactly. a really good way of describing it. And obviously, and he was like, and sometimes you fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes it doesn't go, but it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, he's he's great. Um, yeah, I, my dissertation was really nerdy, and I don't. Oh know my god, I would love to read it, it. please. I'll please, say, yeah, can we I? were. I I was. It was fun because it invited. They invited me afterwards. This is completely off topic, but yeah, they invited me afterwards to contribute to this whole book on curating live arts, etc., which was fun. But Amazing. it was also. Like every everyone at the time was like, uh, my advice was like, oh, maybe you should go for a PhD, and I was like, no, this is the biggest amount of academia and study I've ever done, and I'm grateful, but no thanks. But like I I'm to, fine. Like, it's Thank not you. For me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a friend who's like obsessed with academia. She has like twelve degrees, and I'm like, how? How? Yeah. Like I, I barely gone went through my first one. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I when I moved to the UK in 2014 for a year I was like oh I'll do this course and maybe I'll work as a curator because I feel like that must be super fun yeah. and it's incredible and I love talking to curators but when I did a internship at a museum I was like okay no this is definitely not, not for you this space. Mm. not the space for me just it's funny right you have to kind of have to experiment a bit well completely and I I actually think that will be such a fascinating thing that comes out of the I like networking program is you know we are so I think adverse to uncertainty and this idea of like trial and error just doesn't work for a lot of people a because you know you need to work to make money and um trial and error isn't the best in terms of stability but I think it is an incredibly helpful thing in getting clear on your skill sets and what you like to do and what brings you joy you know so the more I would say people can experiment when they're young and um at university or studying and have a little bit of support around them the better yeah a hundred percent which leads really well into my next question which is do you have an experience where you're like oh my god this i totally failed at this oh my god um i'm sure i have many of them i think i might (laughs) have like completely blocked them out of my mind in an effort to survive i'm let me pick my brain and see if i can think of any that um uh it's okay i can ask you something else in between okay while cool. think about that cool. which is um uh, what is the i used to change this uh, i used to ask something else but i i have now adopted this question from someone else which i can't remember who it was and so i'm sorry if i'm stealing someone's work but what is the worst career advice you've ever had or a life of got advice someone gave you an advice you're like you know thanks i'm not doing that Oh wow! Um, you can have some time. Don't don't worry. We'll I mean, cut the, the wh- thinking one moments. of one of the things. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, one one piece of advice that I actually think is terrible is when people are like, "Oh, you've got to work really, really hard to prove yourself and make your way up the ladder." And I think there is an element of truth in that, but I think that is incredibly dangerous advice because in an attempt to be good and to prove yourself and put the work in, there's also a huge danger that we lose ourselves in that process because we subordinate what we think and what we want to do in order to please other people and what they want us to do. Um, And it puts us in a system where like, if we work incredibly hard and work 14 hours a day, we get validated by that time and by essentially like burning ourselves out. So the flip side advice to that, I think, is just like 
try to remember who you are, take time to rest and process what happened in the day if you need to, and be honest and heartfelt and kind. And like, don't be afraid to ask for what you need or to speak up if you think something isn't right or there could be a better process or to do things, you know. Um, there's a fine balance between having graft and working hard and being enterprising and entrepreneurial and proving yourself and also like that, killing yourself, you know? Yeah. That is incredible. I love that, that you turned like a bad advice into the opposite. Like that's cool. <laughs> really, 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 really good advice. Um, I'll let you think about the failure. You can come back to us later. I'll put that on the show notes if that's important, if you prefer, but yeah, I think if, I will have to think um, about that one. I, cause I definitely have <laughs> failed. Okay. Like, obviously I have failed. Um, it's, it's funny. So someone else from the program, you'll probably listen on the podcast at some point was like, yeah, I was crying on the bathtub. I remember exactly. So some people have like a very like visceral. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I've had like, I'm like you, I'm like, wait, I, there was so many, like I have to go back in time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what's also fascinating about that question is like, you know, there have definitely been things I've done where the outcome has not been perfect, right? But like, I slightly don't think of those as failures, because they still happened. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, But I think all the all the failures actually would probably be come in terms of like process and also fail like just failed relationships and like if you define success in terms of yeah the relationships that you uphold with people it's like all the failures are the missed opportunities to connect with someone in a meaningful way or like you use them for a professional gain or to give you something towards the project but actually like you didn't honor them very well you didn't pay them very well you know those are the it's the micro things that are the real failures I think but I'll think about that a lot more no but it's good I are you would you consider yourself a perfectionist 100% really because I I feel similar to you like whenever I've had failures but I was like yeah if it happened even if it wasn't perfect I'm usually somewhat happy but I'm not a perfectionist at all yeah. I I I mean I am I am a huge perfectionist and it gets in the way of it gets in the way of getting things done and having a good time, you know? It's the quickest way to make something really exciting into feeling absolutely terrible is to try to make it perfect, I think. Um yeah. But but even then, even if things don't come out perfectly, it's kind of like you beat yourself up about it for a day and then you move on to the next project and are motivated by how you can make that infinitely better than the one before. So, you know, the perfectionism is still a bit of a uh, motivating force. Yeah, 100%. All right, well, we've got to wrap up because I've taken a lot of your time. So would you kindly leave us with three things that bring or have brought you joy so they can be a book a film a song artists anything you want yes food recipes whatever love to do that um I think so one of the books that completely just changed my experience and my outlook on life that I read right as we were going into lockdown in March last year um is a book called All About Love by Bell Hooks. And she talks about love essentially being a verb and something that we enact in our actions toward people. And I think if you are seeking connection and wondering how you might be able to honor yourself and honor other people, this is just like an incredible, tender, searing, gorgeous, book so I highly recommend that one 
I have also been loving this podcast produced by the BBC and the Museum of Modern Art called The Way I See It. And it's with a broadcaster called Alistair Sook. And he invites uh, musicians, artists, comedians, actors, each essentially to choose one item in MoMA's collection. And then they tell us how they see it. And that is incredible because it's objects, often things that are familiar, but I've never really engaged with. They're objects that I don't even know. And you just have these people giving incredibly insightful but non-academic responses to things um and then for an artist that brings joy I am going to say Emma Talbot who is our current winner for the Max Mara Art Prize for Women and she for the whole month of March has four animations that play on Piccadilly Circus every night at 8 21 p.m all the advertising gets interrupted and her films are played um and it's a project commissioned by an organization called circa but her work is so visionary for hopeful futures and she has a very bright strong um quite linear and graphic style and i think if you are feeling like you need an outing you want to watch something that's like deeply inspiring head down to Piccadilly Circus at eight twenty one, and Emma Talbot's films will carry you through and lift you up I love that I'm actually a really big fan of Bell Hooks as Yay. well but I didn't know about that podcast so it's definitely going on my list well thank you so much for spending some time with us we look forward to talking to you a lot, lots more throughout the process. And really, thanks again for joining the Deadline Networking program. We're looking forward to working with you closely on that. Um, and I guess I'll speak to you soon. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me and speak to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Island Networking podcast. If you've enjoyed that conversation, why not send it to a friend, rate, review, or subscribe to our podcast because really that helps us a lot. We also have a membership scheme, a mentoring program, online events, digital resources, and much, much more. To get involved with us and figure out everything that we do, just head over to iLightNetworking.uk or find us on Instagram at iLightNetworking. We have more incredible guests coming up next week. So don't forget to tune in every Friday for the podcast. See you next time.